to celebrate my first year of doing videos for YouTube, I decided to do something a little bit different. I wanted to do a video on how I did Fusion at home with the video. And first I want to say that I'm a professional health physicist. I've worked as a health physicist out of college and throughout my career. And if you don't know what a health physicist means, that's an expert in radiation safety. And so this is something that I wouldn't recommend anyone doing at home unless you have a radiation safety expert there who's available to oversee your work and make sure that people are safe. Because the amount of radiation I was producing was dangerous. And by dangerous, I mean deadly. Not just, oh, there's an X-ray machine in the back and you'll get a few milliram. Milliram being the American units for sieverts, where you get a small dose of radiation that's much less than what we typically get a year from nature. This is enough to kill you if you, if you use the same sort of powerful power supplies that I used. Anyway, first I wanted to talk a little bit about how I got to this point. When I left a company I worked at in Soma, I convinced the owner that we could come up with a device that could be used for food and blood irradiation. And I thought that I could come up with an x-ray tube using uh, vacuum arc discharge, which is you take a tube that's partially evacuated, has a little bit of gas, and you run high voltage through it. And so you make uh, arcs through it that produce x-rays. And I, I had a sense that if I used this type of tube instead of a normal vacuum type x-ray tube that I could improve the efficiency and also have distributed um, x-ray production throughout the tube that would allow for a more even um, x-raying of the product. Because at the time there were two types of radiation devices. There were devices that used radioactive sources and these are really big sources. These are sources that could conceivably be used by terrorists to make dirty bombs. And so in the industry where you're trying to get away from using these dirty bomb, potentially dirty bomb usable sources. And that's a project that's ongoing around the world to get rid of these sources. And there were companies that had really high energy x-ray tubes, big x-ray tubes that would uh, replace these sources, but they were very expensive. And, and I thought that I could design something smaller, uh, although I didn't realize the challenges. So I already had the equipment for producing x-rays available. All I had to do was buy a cylinder deuterium and plumb it in. Uh, and normally for x-ray production I use xenon uh, because of its high mass. Anyway, so when we did the experiment, we had about $5,000 worth of hardware. So if you want to do it at this level, you need about $5,000 worth of hardware. You can probably do it for less than a thousand um, if you have access to cheap equipment and, and buy things off of eBay, which I actually did a lot. Um, so we had a cold cathode tube. These were quartz cold cathode tubes, and by cold cathode, it means it doesn't have a filament. It just has points of metal, in this case tungsten, and you put enough voltage through it that it illuminates the gas. Sort of like a neon light, um, but more powerful. And we had these, and we ended up just using that for the electrodes because we modified the tube to use have a bigger diameter tube. It was about a one inch diameter. And we also added piping to it so we could run a vacuum system and introduce the gas through a leak valve. So we had these tubes that were originally from Perkin Homer ILC. We had a big 
144 kilovolt um, transformer that was originally a DC transformer, but we were running it in AC. We, by running it on AC, we get x-rays from both electrodes and throughout the gas to a certain extent. We used resistor strings to limit the current, which was the weak point in the system. Uh, we were constantly uh, destroying the resistor strings and the, the transformer oil would boil and shoot out the top and the resistors would get blown up. And that was part of the problem why we never went into production because we needed a better, a better regulator circuit. Um, we, used, we had a diffusion pump and we had a regular vein type roughing pump so we had a two-stage vacuum system, so we could get down to about 10 to minus 8 vacuum. If you work with vacuum, you'll know what that means. Um, and then we had the cylinder of deuterium. We had a leak valve. Because um, what we, in order to get x-ray production, you needed just a small amount of gas in there in the military range. So, which is a lot in the vacuum world. It's far from being empty, but it's also still a pretty good vacuum. Um, and so, usually between about one and seven millitor, there was this range where we could get um, high voltage. If you have too much gas, the voltage drops. And if you have too little gas, then you don't get any current. You can't get arcs to form at the voltage you're operating. So we had to find a sweet spot of how much gas to introduce. And then we had the whole thing on a Teflon sheet of paper. And from the video, you can see this white thing. That's a big, thick sheet of Teflon. And then that was in a lead-lined bathtub that we had made out of sheets of lead. And we also had a lead curtain that that me and my, my friend and assistant, Dean, would stand behind so that we were safe. And by having this bathtub, it directed any radiation upward, so, and there was nobody upward, so that way nobody else would get any radiation exposure from it. So we had a little Pyrex pan that the tube sat in that we filled with Diala-AX oil, and that um, insulated it from the high voltage so we didn't have arcs escaping. And we had a remote controlled variac, and this is old school technology. It's a big 240 volt AC variac where we could um, change the voltage going into the system from zero to 240. And by doing that, we could, we could make the amount of voltage going to the x-ray tube range from 0 to 144. And in the video, you may faintly hear Dean calling out the voltages. We would measure the voltage on both sides and then add them up to get the total voltage. So if he says 10 and 10, that means it's running at 20 kilovolts. And and you hear the grinding noise, that's the remote controlled. We had it remote controlled so that we weren't anywhere near the high voltage when this was operating and nowhere near the radiation. We would be further away at an area where there's a low background. And we had dosimeters that we can marry where, so we were monitoring the radiation. And we had um, a bike run that's in the video that is calibrated to measure up to 500 rankings per hour. It's an old meter. And when we were doing x-ray production, we were getting up to 500 rankings per hour at three meters from the tube. And when we were doing our x-ray production experiments. And you can see it in the background where it pegs at the high, high end um, but it's not on the highest scale in this experiment. It's only yet running about 50 R per hour, rankings per hour. Um, 
we I did change the scale and the tube ran up to about 100 rankings per hour and it seemed to be the maximum and that was at only two meters uh, during the experiment. And we also had an Everline PNR4 rim ball so we could look for signs of neutrons. And so the experiment stopped when we hit the sweet spot and the rim ball meter went boop and pegged, uh, at least on the low scale. And I, we didn't have any specialized neutron shielding because lead doesn't shield neutrons. You need um, either polycarbonate uh, mixed with boron or water mixed with boron. You need something uh, with lower atomic number that can shield uh, neutrons. And I didn't have anything appropriate, so I wasn't expecting us to get that big of a uh, amount of neutrons coming off of it. So anyway, it looked a little like this. We just had the deuterium bottle, which you see in the video, being plumbed through a leak valve. There's another valve coming off the tube. These are both in the center going to the vacuum system. You see the resistor strings coming down to the, um, to the tube and you see the Pyrex pan that's around it that's filled with oil to isolate it. It's a very simple system, but like I said, if you add up all this equipment and the meters and everything, you're, it was about $5,000 worth of equipment and with a lot of that being used pricing, um, knew it would be a little bit more. So with that, I'll go ahead and play the video clip and then come back at the end. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed watching the video and I hope you like, like this. And as I said, kids don't do this at home, um, not unless you have a radiation safety expert. You could conceivably use a neon light that's been filled with deuterium and with a neon supply. So you could do it with really cheap hardware, but getting the voltage to that sweet spot is, is difficult. And the gas tends to get stuck in the electrodes. So if you have a sealed tube and you start out with gas, once you start making light, um, 
the gas molecules will get stuck in the electrode until you run out of gas and then you don't have any arcs. So that's why we had a flowing system and that was one reason why we never went commercial. Anyway, if you like this video, please like it, share it with your physicist friends or anyone who's interested in fusion, and then subscribe if you want to see more of my videos. And I will say that, that this isn't anything special. The, as far as I can tell, J.J. Uh, Thompson was able to do this back in 1913 uh, with his own uh, X-ray tubes. So, like I said, nothing special, it's just redoing old science and a crazy experiment. Anyway, and also I have some books for sale that if you buy a book that helps support my research and support my videos. And so I appreciate that. Thanks for watching.